Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about Purim, but it's not really geared to Purim only, so therefore we're not going to label this, uh, this shiur or whatever under the category of Purim because it is not about Purim. Or Purim. But we need to understand. We always say that history does not repeat itself. Patterns repeat himself, themselves. And let's analyze the pattern of Purim in order to see if we could learn, which we should, anything about it. The whole gzera, the whole problem of Am Yisrael during the, the, uh, the ordeal of Purim was because they, they did something. And what they did was they said, what well, was the straw that broke the camel's back was the fact that Achashverosh made a party. And of course the party was uh, the celebration of his miscalculation to the time of when the, uh, when the Jews will be uh, saved from this exile. He saw that the time came the Jews were not uh, saved, so therefore he celebrated that. And therefore they were punished. The Jews were punished because of that. The question needs to be asked, okay, so what was the big deal? What was it that they were punished? After all, we do know that the feast that uh, Achashverosh did was a, a glad kosher meal. It was everything kasher lemehadrin. There was no eating treif and so on and so forth. So what was wrong? What was wrong with that? And we always refer to the to the two uh, redemptions of Am Yisrael, both Mitzrayim and uh, Purim, as the redemptions that were done by women and so on and so forth. But there was something fundamentally different between the ordeal in Egypt and the one in Mitzrayim. The one in Mitzrayim, we know that the Jews almost entered every gate of impurity, every gate of Tum'ah. According to some Chachamim, the Ramash of the Avodah Zarah. The Midrash says, El of the Avodah Zarah. These are idol worshippers. These are idol worshippers. The Malachim are referring to Am Yisrael. And yet they were saved. In the time of Mordechai and Esther, they were all Shomret around Mitzvot, and, and yet they were almost got wiped out. Now, one needs to understand that uh, a character like Haman doesn't act on its own. He needs to accept a certain reshut, permission from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. What does that mean? When Am Yisrael does something wrong, The gzera comes from Hashem. The decree comes from Akadosh Baruch Hu. And every nation has so-called its, its, uh, its agent or its angel who uh, acts upon. It's like a shaliach, like a messenger. When a nation takes it upon itself to execute... Dina de Malchuta Dina, right? So there they act as a way, as a form of punishment to Am Yisrael. However, how would they execute that decree? It's up to the free choice. When the Jews don't act, somebody needs to remind them that they're Jews. There are different ways. I'll show you a decree. Even today, you hear more and more voices in Europe that don't allow kosher shechita. They say it's inhumane. I think it's first of all inhumane to eat animals to begin with. If you want to go that far, what's more humane to kill an animal with a with a bullet to its head or with a knife to its neck? I mean, it's the same thing. You're killing, you're killing. It's the hypocrisy. 
So you see that the decree is not about being humane, it's about something that has to do with the Jews. So it started in countries like uh, Holland and, and so on and so forth, and it goes to Denmark. And now even in England, the Jews felt safe because they thought, oh, we have political power. You know, we are, we, we are strong in England. Even now there are voices in England that wants to abolish kosher shechita. And that's a form of decree. Based on how you execute that, right? the fact that, let's say, if I would excommunicate somebody here, right, they can put me, file a lawsuit against me, that's also a form of oppression. I'm not free to practice my religion to its full extent. Right? Like examples, as we had mentioned previously, like, you know, where we were learning the Mishnayot. There's certain things I cannot do in this country. So Am Israel did that wrong thing, going to the Seuda of Haman. And the decree came, and Haman, I'm sorry, and Haman decided to act upon it and therefore to abolish Am Israel. And we have to see what's the problem. The problem is that in, we said before, in Egypt, they were idol worshippers. However, they kept the desire to be Jewish, even their Avodah Zarah they did as Jews. And we know, as the Midrash tells us, the Gemara tells us, they kept their name, they kept the clothing, they kept the language. These are the foundations of a, of a culture. If you want to destroy a culture, take away their national identity, take away the language, the names. So instead of uh, instead of speaking Apache and calling your son Kuchis, you're going to give him English, and you're going to call them uh, Johnson. And now you took a Indian and you made it into a something else. It's a re-education. So they kept their names. They kept the language, they kept their identity as Jews. They were Avodah they kept their identity as Jews. However, at the time of Achashverosh, they kept the mitzvot. They kept the, the, they learned the Torah and so on and so forth. But they didn't really want to do that. They were always looking into the plate of what happens on the other side. There was no Jewish pride in what they were doing. They were more interesting in, in hanging around in, in balls and in parties and, and, and feasts and, and ceremonies and actually to sit down and to find the chedva, the joy in developing your own culture, your own identity and so on and so forth. It's like a person, how, does, how would a father feel if he's asking his son-in-law, because he hears that then things are not so well. And his son-in-law says, you ask him, oh, so what's the story? You're gonna, you want to divorce my daughter or something? So he said, no, I don't. So, but I heard things are really bad. You, you guys don't talk for like a year. He said, yeah, so why won't you divorce her? So he said, listen, you know, I like you. You have a lot of money. That's terrible. That's not love. When we do Avodat Hashem and we always look what they do, how they do, and I'm adopting non-Jewish culturally behavior, I'm losing my Jewish identity. There's in a way almost no point to do what I do. Because it's, a, it's an absurd, it's a paradox, because the mitzvot, fulfilling the mitzvot, leaving the Torah, doing the mitzvot, is what defines me as a Jew. So in a way, in a way, if a person doesn't do mitzvot and doesn't learn the Torah, in a way, what, what's the difference between him and a guy? There's no difference. Because that's what defines me. However, what's the point of doing the mitzvot if I don't want to be seen as a Jew? And do we do the same thing? Why you call your kid Tom? 
Call him a little Tembel, call him Tuvia, whatever you call him. Why do you call him Tom? Now, I have nothing to do him Tom, right? But, you know, why do you call him that? He's a Jewish kid. Look, even people, you know, African Americans, they came from Africa. Adopt themselves when they want to identify. They call them Muhammad Ali. That was Cassius Clay. It was Muhammad Ali, you know. Lua Lissendor, it became Karim Abdul Jabbar. The name defines you. The name, and it is true not only for you, for places. When the white man came to, to, to this place, he called it New York, New Amsterdam. I didn't know it wasn't that. No other names. I don't know whatever the name was. You change the name of places, you change the name of rivers, or change the name of mountains. Because by giving it a name, you define what it is. So when you're giving your child a non-Jewish name, you don't really give him a great chance to make it through. I mean, I know this, the name Lawrence sounds majestic. But call your, your son, uh, I don't know what, uh, Reuven. Why you call him Robert? Call him Rachamim, I don't know, whatever you call him. But why those names? Because it said something. You don't want your kid to be associated as a Jew. Therefore, you give him a non-Jewish name. And then you change your name from, uh, I don't know what. Uh, give me a name, I don't know. Huh? From, from, uh, from Leibovich, you make it, uh, you, you make it uh, I don't know what, Smith. What the good call is that Leibovich? Not the label which is a is a, a Jewish name in terms of the translation of it. However, Jews have the name Leibovich. Or call yourself, you don't like Leibovich, call yourself Lev, Hart. Find a Jewish name, Hebraize your name, there's nothing wrong with that. Your last name is, I don't know what, uh, Aish, call yourself Arye. It's an identity. And the Jews over there didn't do it. Why? Because every single day, even though every single thing I did, the, the Hanhagah, the conduct of the daily thing, was according to the Torah, but I did not feel that, I'm be that I belong to this thing that's called Am Israel. I'm doing it because I'm just doing it. I'm doing what I'm doing. But I don't feel that I belong to it. And that is a, that's a tremendous insult. And, you know, what's the point of, for example, a person learns the Gemara. He sits down and he learns Gemara because, you know, culturally he's expected to sit down and learn. And this is also some of the problem that we do, you know. He feels that he needs to sit down and learn because if he's going to learn less than 12 hours a day, people would look at him funny. But then he closes the Gemara and he goes down downtown Manhattan to play pool and to do this and to do this. He doesn't feel he belongs to that. One time, you know, if, if, if a guy comes to you, well, we have this thing, whole thing about Israel and the army and the whole entire thing. I'm not a big advocate of this whole thing, but let's look at it. A kid comes to you, says to you, listen, Rebbe, I don't want to learn in yeshiva. I cannot sit down and learn yeshiva all the time. I want to go to the army. So you ask him, why do you want to go to the army? If he tells you, because I can't stand learning Gemara and so on and so forth, so I will be very careful. But if he says, I want to contribute, I want to do so, so you know that the kid has some kind of a shayachut. He feels that he belongs to these people. That's my people. I want to help them. So if you, you need to encourage that and try to root it out to a way that he would do something, according to Ruach HaTorah, something that would help him and so on and so forth. But the most important thing is not just a siyata mitzvot like a robot is to feel that you really belong to this. These are your people. This is what you, this is who you are. Because it speaks, actions speak louder than words. If you close the Gemara and you go out to, to a hookah bar, that speaks louder than you sitting down and learning. Unfortunately, even today, we have people who are, would be shayachim, would belong to misgeret, to a format of limud, but really the heart is not here. The heart is not in the yeshiva. The heart is to go out. And that's what I keep telling you all the time. 
I would rather that you work so you can learn rather than you learn so you can work. The result might be the same thing. This guy works half a day and learns half a day. The other one does the same thing. But the attitude is what is important. If a person works so he can learn, so therefore everything that he does, the work, the, 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 the preparation, is a preparation for him to come and learn. Everything is directed towards the Torah. That's his center. But if a person learns so he can go out to work, like somebody says to me, oh, Rabbi, you know, I want to learn Masechet Bava Kama. Yeah, why do you want to learn Masechet Bava Kama Davka? Well, I heard that if I learned this, I could be a good lawyer. So you're not learning because you really want to learn what you people do, what's the halacha, what's the, how is the Jewish, uh, and so on and so forth, way to look at things and the involvement. You're interested in that to develop your intellect. So you know, I go play some brain games and, and, instead of doing that. That's the attitude behind it. That's the most important thing. And, and we, need to, we need to know the boundaries that we need to, we are a part, hey, we are a part of the world. We are a part of the world. But we have to be engaged in the part of the world as a fully pledged Jew. Judaism would not restrict your involvement and your success in the outside world. But as much as the heart could not be a foot, a foot cannot be a heart. And your job is to be a Jew, well-versed Jew, proud to be a Jew, involved in the world. Doing your hashpa, of course, if you want to learn, you learn. But you're doing your hashpa outside in the world, and that's something that we need to understand. And we face this problem all the time. That's why I said to you, this is not about Purim. This is about how, about learning Torah, being in yeshiva. What am I doing? My attitude stinks, and I'm not willing to pay the price, because when the time comes, when I really see. That let's say I have now finals. I'm not going to come to Yeshiva to learn. I'm more concerned. Oh, Rabbi, I really got to go. I have a class in an hour and a half. Well, how long does it take you? Half an hour. No, it's an hour and a half. I got to be there early. I don't want to be late. But where in the world was the last time you came on time to Yeshiva? You go to the gym. You go to karate. You do this. You do Pilates. You do. You, know, you take a shower for like uh, you know in a spa. You stroll into yeshiva, and when you come in, you know, it's like a slow start. I have to jump start you all the time. You don't come in with this oomph. I'm coming to learn. Let's go. Let's roll. Let's take the stuff out. Let's go. And when I'm learning, you're not learning with a full heart. I'm learning. Maybe I get some college credits and the this and the that. You're not thinking about what's going to happen to you. You're not thinking about what's going to happen to your children. Don't hide that. No, no, you know, you know, no, you know. Yeah, 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 the, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Code word Olga. <laughs> right? You know what I'm saying? It's not the same attitude. And, and, and you know what? It, it has to do a lot also with the way you are outside. The outside influence the inside, the inside influence the outside. And the way you dress, and the way you talk, and the way you conduct yourself. That has an influence on your inside as well. It's, 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 a, it's a cycle. As much as if you're feeling sad, you could be in great health, you know, physically. But if you're sad, your spirit is down, your whole body becomes like a mush. And you could be physically ill, lo aleinu. But you're spiritually awake and you have more power to, you know, an 80 year old that has a good attitude can achieve more in life than a 20 year old that his attitude stinks. It's one influence the other. So do you need to be very careful about the way you look? You know what? There's no need. We are not, we're not Iroquois and we're not Mohawks and we can, we should not wear Mohawks. Hey, haircuts. I have nothing against Afros. If, you, if that's your, you know, that's your culture, that goes on the head, good, good for you, wear afros. Actually, I think it's nice, nothing wrong with that. But not for a Jew. Because for us, it creates a problem. I, I put that feeling, it has to be on my head. I'm committed to this kind of life. That there's no, there's no such thing for me that Judaism is a part of my life. 
as much as everything else is a part of my life. Going out is a part of my life, having fun, playing tennis, playing golf, uh, going to, uh, to the Caribbean, going to, and so on and so forth. It's a part of my life. I have different parts of my life. I have a little, the cake that's called my life, and different compartments, so everything is. Somewhere along the line, big or small, there's a little sliver, it's called Judaism. It's a part of my life. That is wrong. Judaism is your life. And everything that you do, you do as a Jew. That you should. You do it as a Jew. That's a commandment. And that's what happened there. So when you learn, a person needs to understand that the Torah is a, is a bubbling brook. Ma'ayan Novea. It's a bubbling brook. It's Mekro Chaim. It's a source of life. It's the water that we drink. Outside is the desert. We need to understand that a person needs to understand that the Kesha, the connection to the Torah, is the way he's going to act his life. The true pleasure, the uncommitted pleasure that you'll have, right? the, the unspoiled pleasure that you'll have, is, is the pleasure of sitting down and learning. And for me, yesterday... It was really amazing. Some of you guys were learning Masechete with him. It's not an easy Masechete, very difficult concept, and so on and so forth. And yet there were some people that I spoke to people before, and they, they, they dismissed the fact that these people could ever learn Gemara. And there were people here that were explaining subjects, topics in, in this Masechete like a pro. And that can only happen when you are connected to it not only here in the intellect, in, in here, in your, in your belly button. And this is just the beginning. But this is your test. And the test is every single day. And there's no reality besides the reality as it comes out from the Torah. Rav Ben Tzion HaBashaul Allah Shalom used to say that it's not that you need to explain the Torah according to science. Science needs to find explanation according to the Torah. Because, the, again, it's the attitude. Because if I'm finding, trying to justify the Torah based on science, I'm basically saying science is a, is a second violin. Important, a second violin. I'm feeling... Not first class about my Torah. I'm apologetic about being a Jew. I think you can't. And as a Jew does certain things, a Jew doesn't do. And what's this whole thing that I hear that people have now, bachelor parties before you get married? What kind of a garbage is that? And all these traditions that are not Jewish. The Jewish celebration of, of, of the, and the preparation of the chuppah and the bride and, and the groom are beautiful. People would pay money to have such traditions. The shomer, look at the difference. Some people go to bachelor parties and bang me not what they have there. If I was a kala and my, and my chatan we, a night before we're getting married, we'll go to a bachelor party. I will divorce this punk. I don't want to see you. But you're going to prison. On the contrary, a Jewish chatan has a shomer, somebody that understands, we understand the danger, the spiritual danger of almost letting go. You have somebody, a good friend of yours, you sit down with you, you learn at night. You sit down to, some people stay up all night, some people stay up as far as they can, as much as they can. You stay up, you learn. You sit down, you learn. If you have one or two, you, put your, you make your tzitzit of your talit that you're going to make tomorrow, brachaon. You put the tzitzit together. The symbolism is great. The details, that great details, that great symbolism with the small details, this is the spice of your life. And when you drive your cars, you need to drive your cars like Jews. And you need to dress up like Jews and act like Jews. And we are not Uzbek. And we're not Polish. We're not Turkish. We're not Spanish. We're not German. We're not Austrian Jews. We, we're not. We are Jews. 
Don't forget, that was the claim of Haman. There's one nation who is spread it and, and spread up all over the place and is divided among itself. That allowed him the opening. And we allow this opening all the time. And the Torah is what puts us together. The Torah is the same. Shulchan Aruch is the same, whether you printed it in Poland or you printed it in Morocco. When you read Tosfot, you don't say, excuse me, Tosfot, <laughs> they're from France. I don't, I don't read them. Look at the beautiful thing we have. I told you this, every Jewish community has its own form of chulent, but everybody makes chulent. That's why it's important to eat hot meals on Shabbat. Don't be lazy. Make something. Make something out of your life. Make something out of the Torah. The Torah is the glue that puts Am Yisrael together. Therefore, the Torah should not be what breaks Am Yisrael apart. If a person learns Torah and is a dividing factor, either he's not a Jew or he doesn't learn Torah appropriately. One of the two. A person who is a Ben Torah puts it together. Puts Amisel, this is the core in which we all, and that's why when Akadosh Baruch Hu gave us the Torah in Har Sinai, we all gather down together. Machane, group. We all gather together around the mountain, and we all received it at one time. So Rabotai, don't make the mistakes that they make. And I'll call upon you now a challenge to start living your life from this point and on as proud Jews. Don't be afraid to announce your Judaism. Don't take your kippah down. Grow your beards. Dress up like Jews. I know, Sfaradim, we put the tzitziot inside. But if this will do it to you, put your tzitziot outside. Because it's a strength for you. You are daring to make a statement, I'm a Jew. And don't forget to act like one as well. Not dress up like one. But you understand the meaning and the importance behind it. You do that, it's very simple. You'll be saved. You don't do that, you have a problem. Have a great day.